Welcome, I'm John Caldera, president of the Independence Institute and your devil's advocate. I've been looking forward to this one for a long time. One of the most iconic characters in Colorado, well, Colonel Robert Brown. We call him Bob Brown, the author and founder of Soldier of Fortune magazine. Colonel, good to see you again. My pleasure, John. Now, the idea that this wildly politically incorrect publication that you started now 40 years ago. This is 40 years of the, no, no magazine lasts 40 years. I don't know if you know this. Well, we did. You, I, I don't know how you did, but this, that, that this magazine grew out of Boulder, Colorado is, is one of those little bits of Boulder in, in Colorado history that this magazine, which is so opposite of everything that is Boulder, I hope so. You grew out of Boulder. Why, why did you start the magazine in Boulder before we get into what the magazine really is? Well, you have to understand, John, that uh, I've lived in Boulder, except when I've been in the Army or traveling, since uh, I completed my BA there at the University of Colorado back in 54. That was under, you had a history major, right? That's correct. And then after my first tour in the Army, I came back to Boulder for my master's degree. And as I mentioned earlier, I set some kind of record in the length of time it took me to get it. In fact, I think they just gave me the degree to get me out of the department. <laughs> but uh, that and being, was that was there, did you have a master's in history yes. as well? No, master's in political science, a minor in history. So the point back and then uh, point is that back in those days, Boulder was nine thousand people. Uh, everything east of Twenty Eighth Street was ranch land. I used to ride my horse down the dirt road. Where McDonald's is it used to be the, uh, the powwow grounds, the rodeo grounds. Wow. And uh, what a wonderful place it was. And uh, once again, you're only an hour and a half from skiing, uh, a couple hours from uh, hunting, fishing, great place. Now you've got about nine, well, I'd say 91,000, too many people in Boulder. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, be that as it is, uh, uh, people have often ask, why not in publishing, why not in New York or, 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 or Los Angeles? I said, are you crazy when I can live here? So I just ignore the loons in Boulder. Watch uh, out, you know, they're calling you the loon in well, Boulder. That's their prerogative. Yeah, that's I mean, they've prerogative. called you that for 40 years now. So. Yes, they have. All right, talk, talk to me about the beginning of the magazine. You were in the service, you fought in Vietnam, and you started the magazine in the mid '70s. What what was the goal? You were out of the army at that point. You were you were no well, longer active, quick right? Quick background, it was rather bizarre. When I I was a co-owner of Paladin Press, and I sold my interest out to Peter Lund, uh, and I had a few bucks, and so I decided, well, time to go to Africa. Well, first of all, what was Paladin Press? That that's a whole other beautiful, bolder story. This was a a book company that put out books for soldiers, put out books on, on uh, how to build bombs, how to, how to, how to do all these militaristic things. And it was also not very popular. Definitely not. Well, it was an offshoot of a publishing company I started way back in 1963 uh, when I published a book called 150 Questions for a Gorilla, uh, which was written by a Spanish loyalist who trained Fidel Castro before he went invaded Cuba in 1956. And so that from that, I grew a little publishing company. And when I came back from Vietnam, I got together with Peter Lund. Uh, he had money, I had none. We put the company together with his input of cash, and that started Paladin Press. That happened in 1970. Then I sold my interest out in 1974. He paid you, you had a little bit of money and you decided to start this magazine? Well, no, not the, quite that simple. Went to Africa, I linked up with a, a chap uh, that I'd been in correspondence with, uh, that was with the British, with the police in, in Rhodesia. And uh, we hung around together for a couple of three weeks and he told me that some of his mates, when their contract with the Rhodesians were, was over, were going to work with the Sultan of Oman. So I got the address and I wrote to Sultan. And I got a letter back and an invitation to join the Sultan's army, which didn't impress me because I wasn't impressed about running around in the sand. But uh, I did get a 40-page document of all the information about joining, pay, benefits, et cetera. So I started running a little ad, $5, how to become a mercenary in the Mideast. And, and I got 
more, more. And you ran the ad where? In little gun magazines, and also, and it was picked up by Newsweek. And then I got inquiries from all over the world, from Bangladesh, from Holland, from people wanting to be mercenaries. So let, let me let me see if I understand this. So you're out there, you get you get some information on if you want to work for the Sultan, and you say. I can make a few bucks off of this. Precisely. I'm going to put out some ads, and if somebody wants to look at this, send me five bucks. That's I'll right. send you a photocopy of it. We even got a inquiry order from a 44-year-old high school principal in South Bend, Indiana, that had never been in the military. Well, also, my buddies were looking at uh, the situation with Vietnam recognition. And we decided that this would be an opportunity to spin out into a magazine and give Vietnam veterans the recognition they richly deserve, as we discussed earlier. You know, our red, the blood we shed was just as red as that shed in World, in World War II, II and World uh, War I, Civil Korea, War, right. but we didn't get the recognition. So we started publishing what I call Vietnam Hero Stories. And our circulation just shot up. Can you give me a definition? I've heard the term, forget the magazine, soldier of fortune. What is a soldier of fortune? Well, all in the eyes of the beholder, it depends on how you want to define it. For the most part, you can say an individual fights for a cause or for money or for adventure without being part of a regular army. If if somebody does that, so we, we understand what soldiers are. We, people enlist, they get, in, they get into the service, they keep with it, they're, they're passionate about it, especially now with an all-volunteer army. People aren't in the army unless they want to be in the army. But particularly after Vietnam, were there people who wanted to just keep in an army even if it wasn't an American army? And were they a soldier of fortune? They were, these are mercenaries. Isn't, isn't soldier of fortune a mercenary? Well, it depends, once again, matter of definition of the terms. Webster defines a mercenary as an individual who fights under a foreign flag for pay. Now, probably the best known example back in the 70s was, of course, Rhodesia, which during the Rhodesian conflict, there were probably about 450 Americans that served in the Rhodesian forces. But they were subject to the same rules and regulations, got the same pay as a regular Rhodesian soldier, much like the 20,000 Canadians that came down and volunteered for the U.S. military and fought in Vietnam. Very few people realize really? there were 20,000 Canadians that, that volunteered. That's correct, and went to Vietnam and fought. And they were paid by the United, United States, States government. I had never heard that. Or another example is when I was in Vietnam, I was a special forces team leader. I uh, had a camp with uh, 576 mercenaries, even though they were mountain yard tribesmen and Cambodians, but they were paid by the U.S. government. So according to Webster, they would be mercenaries. Wow. So Soldier Fortune grew out of these stories grew out of of you needing to make a buck as well. Precisely. Yeah, terrible, terrible I, idea. I make no, no excuse for that. But particularly in the early years, in the 70s, there was a real tie between your readership and Vietnam vets. What what was that tie? Why was it that there was that affinity between between the two? Was it, was it a way for vets to be able to connect because they didn't feel, uh, un, unlike vets today, who when you're at the airport, People clap. They let them go on the airplane the, uh, first. There, there is a respect there that when you came home wasn't there. That's precisely true. And, and once again, the recognition factor, uh, the fact that we were publishing stories about Vietnam and, and nobody else wanted to publish this stuff. And so we did, and, and the Vietnam veterans appreciated that. Then it grew to something else, particularly during the height of the Cold War, a lot of soldiers of fortune, mercenaries, would they use Soldier of Fortune magazine as a way to connect themselves if they wanted to go back into service, but not with the American army, but be hired someplace else? Certainly that was true in Rhodesia. In fact, we were investigated, uh, the former Congress lady, uh, little loony, but uh, the Democrat from Denver here, Patty Schroeder, Peppermint Patty, as I we remember. Call her. Remember and her well. She was incensed by the fact that we were publishing uh, uh, stories about Rhodesia, 
and information about how you could go join the Rhodesian Army. We actually had a recruit, recruiting poster published in the magazine, and so she got the FBI to investigate us. But you see, there was nothing they could do because all we were doing was providing information. We weren't recruiting. And this was all before the internet age as well, yes, so there's yeah. no way for for soldiers who wanted to do this to get that information, you but, were it. But the uh, Rhodesian recruiting, I mean recruiting officer, Major Lamprick, told me that uh, three quarters of the Americans that came to Rhodesia to serve found out about it from Soldier Fortune magazine. Soldier Fortune for 40 years has had a connection with the military, but it, it's not stars and stripes. It's not, you know, a rah, rah, um, magazine it is it is a soldier's magazine when I said you, you show me this book and this this amazes me um, the American sniper uh, you, you know uh, Chris Chris Kyle who the movie was based on this on on this man yeah, correct uh, the Clint Eastwood movie and it, it was and it was remarkably well done and we just let me just flip this and this to you he writes thank you for all your great articles you actually piqued my interest to join the military that you know that the connection between this hated magazine called Soldier of Fortune would bring out this American hero. Well, as I mentioned earlier, John, there's no question that the thing that I'm most proud about with the magazine is the fact uh, regarding the number of young men that I have encouraged through the magazine to join the military and where they've done quite well. Every week I get a call from somebody that says, yeah, I read Soldier of Fortune magazine when I was 10 years old and that prompted me to go to eventually go to Ranger School or join the Army and go to Ranger School. So I take great pride in that. Do, do you feel that Soldier of Fortune, which you know, during the 70s and oh, I remember during the 80s and, even, and early 90s, this was considered uh, a hate magazine this was this was a perverse sick magazine and and now do you feel that people are, are turning around and going wow it had an impact on the type of military the United States has today well I think do you, the, do you feel vindicated in the, other words uh, we certainly weren't politically correct then and we certainly no you're not you're still not politically correct. I hope no so. one has ever accused you of that yes Colonel. thank you very much uh, I take great pride in that fact do you feel vindicated you feel that people have come around to say that that this magazine is 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 not for oddballs anymore? Well, to be brutally candid, I don't give a hoot what people think. <laughs> uh, a lot of people agree with me, and those that don't, they can shoot their mouths off someplace else. What was the toughest time for you publishing this magazine? I'm sorry. What was the toughest time? What was the hardest? If it was there a crisis, I know that you've had a battle back lawsuits. You've had a battle back bad PR. You've lost reporters in the field. I mean, this this oh, has yeah. been a wild ride. Yes, I well, I, I've had, as I mentioned, I had a reporter killed in Nicaragua, one in Angola, uh, one in uh, Sierra Leone, and one in Burma. And they were reporting on the conflicts. Yes, or of course, the, the thing was, was that uh, we were involved in what I describe now as participatory journalism. I mean, one of my, for instance, my reporter in, in Burma that was killed, West Point graduate, Ranger School, Airborne School, signed to the Ranger Regiment, and he got a, a, out of the Army because he was bored. There was nothing happening. So he went to work for us. Great. When you say bored, are you talking about there are soldiers who want to be in Precisely. military action. They don't want to Precisely. just be drilling. Precisely. They, they want to be in conflict. That's correct. That's correct. Why do they want to be in conflict? Well, in my case, I wanted to see what happened when somebody shot at me. I found out. I didn't particularly like it. <laughs> but uh, it's the ultimate test. It is the ultimate... Ultimate test of what? Whether you have the cojones to stand up and do your job or whether you're going to run. But isn't there a difference between standing up and doing your job when you're defending your own country? If, if, um, if you're fighting Nazis to pre preserve America, that's one thing. You get hired by a sultan or Rhodesia to put your life on the line for money. Is that, that seems very different to most people. Oh, it is. But nonetheless, uh, 
uh, people have done that since the beginning of history. Uh, whether you're talking about the 10,000 Macedonians that uh, went through uh, the Middle East, et cetera, it's, it's always been that or, way. Or the Germans that the uh, Great, Great Britain stationed here during our Revolutionary War. They were paid. Precisely. They were mercenaries. Why is the glamour of that? What, 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 over, over all those centuries, what draws a man to do that? Well, I think uh, um, there's a multitude of uh, reasons. Uh, some people, some of the people I knew that went to Rhodesia didn't go there for the money. They because they saw it as an extension of the fight against communism and the fact that we had essentially lost in Vietnam. Although we didn't lose militarily, we lost in Washington D.C. when we cut all the aid to the South Vietnamese and refused to go in and bomb the armored columns of the North Vietnamese when they invaded in '75. The the invasion, and this is something the left doesn't want to admit. Uh, but the overthrow of the South Vietnamese government wasn't by a bunch of disgruntled farmers. It was by armored columns that came down from North Vietnam. It was no different than the Nazis invading Poland or France. And at one time we had promised to provide them with their support if this happened. And of course Nixon, if he had been alive, he, I have no doubt, would have done it. We stopped them with B-52s in the Easter offensive in March of 72. And we could have done so in '75, but uh, but but that the, the guys going to Rhodesia, the guys particularly in the '70s, was there a lot of feeling of we were this fight against communism was right in Vietnam, and just because the country pulled out doesn't mean I'm going to pull out. That's correct. That's yeah. correct. Now I won't say everybody. I mean, right. some people did it for the adventure. Some people did it because they had uh, problems at home. Uh, a multitude of reasons, once again, motivations for people to do it. How, what was, what was the top circulation when, when, when this was, you know, to keep any magazine in business, but how many copies have you sold over the years? What, oh. What, well, I don't what's know. The, what's the, the magazine circulation? The, 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 uh, the, uh, and why are they always smiling on the cover? Yeah. Let me tell you, I'm, I'm getting shot out. I'm, I'm not going to be smiling. Well, you wasn't being shot at when yeah. the picture was taken. <laughs> That's why. Who advertises? How did? I mean, it's not just subscription. It is, it is advertisements as well. So over the years, was it people? Was it countries who wanted the soldiers? Were they your advertisers, or were they the stories? Well, we used to carry personal ads, which we don't anymore, and they were, uh, uh, what shall I say, sent in by individuals that were looking for employment, and some of them. I had uh, one reporter, that uh, good friend of mine that uh, got, ran an ad in the magazine. He was working for me as an advertising director. He'd be in a B-52 and F-4 pilot in Vietnam, and he ran a little ad in the uh, classified section. Got a job through with the CIA. So, uh, you, so there's a lot of stuff you just don't know that goes on out there. Uh, but he, he had a very interesting time, almost got executed, but uh, that's another story. Now, didn't story. those want ads get you in trouble as well? The, they did, they those, did. You know, they because did. You, people connected themselves. This was before the internet. This was before Craigslist. People connected themselves through want ads, whether it was Rolling Stone magazine or Soldier of Fortune. That's true. We had, we had, some, we had some legal problems because a couple of guys got together and they ended up committing murder. But we were, we maintained the magazine was tried uh, rather than the, the, the merits people. of the case because these two guys had connected through the magazine and never discussed anything illegal for six months. And finally, they, for whatever reason, they decided to get involved in a dreadful situation. Well, that's like two people meeting in a bar and after three or four days or five weeks or six months, they decide they're going to rob a bank. Why are you going to blame the bar? I mean, why did we get blamed for this? But that's life. That's, you put this together a couple years ago, I Am Soldier of Fortune. This, yeah. is, this is your biography, your, your uh, autobiography. Right. What, you know, th um, who's the young guy in the cover? I, I've known you for a while. I, I, don't, I don't remember this guy. Well, he's the same guy that was on... On oh, the same guy on the back, on the back cover. <laughs> yeah, well, that's in Afghanistan back in... I'm probably the only reporter who's gone into Afghanistan three times, and each time 
fired up a Russian fort. What do you mean fired up a Russian well, fort? Well, I shot rockets at them. Really? Shot mortars at them, yes. Not bad. What do we find out in the book? Pardon? What's, what's the story in the book? This is, this is the story of you creating for it's Soldier Fortune. essentially the story and, and of the, me the in the magazine in the last 40 years. Including rewards that you would put out for things you wanted. The one that got me was a $100,000 reward from you for what? Well, that's a great story. Uh, you know, we, one of the projects that we were involved in over the years was training the Contras. Uh, and and the, the, the Sandinistas had brought in Russian gunships, MI-24s. So we put an award out, reward, $100,000 for the first one to defect with the Nicaraguan crew. So I happened to be in Washington in the old executive building talking to Colonel Ollie North about another project. And this subject came up and he says, well, why are you only offering $100,000? I said, well, I'll leave it because I only have $100,000. Yeah. And he says, well, why don't you offer a million? And I said, because I don't have a million. <laughs> he said, well, I'll make up the difference. I said, well, okay, Ollie. And so we started offering a million dollars. The objective here wasn't really to get a MI-24, but it was to sow dissension among, and suspicion amongst the Nicaraguan Air Force that they would shut their operations down, which were targeting the Contras. So in other words, it wasn't so much that you or the military wanted the great correct. secrets of this gunship. That's correct. Because it wasn't, it's not high, it's there not, was, it's not was, a Russian submarine. It was not hot intel at the right. time. It was, you want to sow these thoughts of, wait, I could defect and make and a million did. dollars? And we did, we were successful. How do you uh, measure that success? Well, I'll tell you. A good friend of ours uh, was a talking head for ABC, a guy by the name of Peter Collins, and he was covering Central America at that point in time. He had connections, as any good reporter, on both sides of the conflict. So he had connections into the Sandinistas. And he had found out from them they had to shut their helicopter operation down for three weeks. Pardon me, three months. Well, they brought in Cuban pilots to fly the missions while they could vet the Nicaraguan pilots to make sure they wouldn't defect. And being the cheap bastard that you are, did you ever pay out a reward? Well, we never had a helicopter defect. So you got the job done and it cost you Precisely. nothing. That's well, pretty good stuff. They would, they would have probably got the million bucks because at that time, Ollie North had access to all illegal funds, et cetera. Which, did you know anything about that when it was going on? I didn't really, not at that time. I, I noticed the word really in there. I didn't really. Well, you can interpret that any I way I will you interpret want. that any way <laughs> I choose. Hey, let's, let's bring it to, to, to today. This magazine is going and, and hitting a brand new generation. Um, who reads it today? Well, we haven't done any uh, reader surveys. Uh, certainly, uh, Zali North said some time ago, uh, every place he went in Viet uh, pardon me, Vietnam, every place he went in uh, Afghanistan or Iraq, he would see people reading Soldier of Fortune. In fact, if you go into our Facebook and click on it, you'll see uh, a group of troops in an armored vehicle, and they're reading Soldier Fortune magazine. So we've always had uh, great circulation, and, and what you do, what happens is, you'll have a sergeant who'll go down to the PX, he'll buy a, co a copy, and then the whole platoon will read it. We only have about a minute or two left. I wanna, I wanna if I can make a detour to local politics. Sure. You have been a strong supporter of the Second Amendment, uh, of an armed citizenry. We've got some battles going on here in Colorado, including the latest gun laws that came in that took away our, our magazines and limited them to 15 rounds. There's a guy out there named Dudley Brown who runs an organization called Rocky Mountain Gun Owners. And he's, he's killing a way to get us back at least to 30 rounds as we get back to full rounds. You've dealt with this, this guy before, and I, I don't think anybody's as qualified as you uh, to speak for gun owners. Who is this guy? What is he? Well, he's, he's in a race for the world's greatest charlatan. Uh, he's been in this uh, arena for years, but it wasn't until a few years ago when he got a good copywriter. And he's always promoting this concept, send me money, the sky is falling, the sky is falling, I'm gonna send petition. Well, 
Sending petitions to congressmen and senators has no impact whatsoever. He is a charlatan that takes people's money just for his own satisfaction, edification, and he does no good. For instance, he took credit back during the recall elections down in Pueblo, which I was involved in the periphery of said elections, and he came down a few days before the election or had some of his people and they handed out some hats. That was it. But he ended up taking credit for it. And raising money. So uh, the guy shoots his mouth off, he raises money, he promises things, but uh, he does nothing. Would you say he actually works against gun absolutely, owners' best interests? Absolutely, interest? because you can make a good case, and this case was made very effectively in a couple of years ago in a magazine called 5280, which essentially said that uh, because of his machinations and his bumblings, uh, he gave the Colorado legislature to the Democrats. And, and he has. He has, precisely. There's a coalition growing of people who want to tell Republicans that if they give us back our magazines, bring us back to 30 rounds, we will protect you from the, the challenges he's going to bring forward. He wants to primary anybody who makes the situation better. He, he and Bloomberg are now working to keep us from getting 30 round magazines. Well, he, will, will, you, will you stand up with us uh, uh, um, and say we've got your backs you bet. when you do it? You betcha. Now his, what he has done is gone in, uh, in, in, in a number of legislative races and supported candidates that, that had no work. chance of winning. And when the election, the general election, they lose. Colonel, thank you. Congratulations on 40 years. Thank you. We'll see you next week.